السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Continuing with the 10 principles for purification of the soul by Sheikh Abdul Razak Al-Badr Hafidhahullah Ta'ala Last week we started our journey with regards to these points and we covered a few principles that inshallah we found beneficial for our soul Today we'll start with the fourth principle with the Sheikh he said اتخاذ الأسوة والقدوة to take a role model and a guide for you on your journey to purifying your soul. As we know, anybody who wants to improve themselves in their sphere of work in general, or anybody who wants to improve themselves in terms of their qualifications, etc., one of the best ways to do that is to have a guide, is to have an example, is to have a mentor, a coach, that you can look up to and who can take you by your hand along the journey that you need to travel. So many times you find that if you try to learn something from scratch by yourself, you can waste countless hours. And of course, we don't have these countless hours to waste in our lives. But if you have somebody that's already achieved the objectives and knows how to reach the goals, they can get you there much quicker. They can get you there directly without you having to go left and right. And of course, the case with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in terms of getting us to the objective of purifying our soul, the example is much clearer why we need to take the Prophet ﷺ as a role model, as a mentor, as a coach, as a guide, etc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم أسوة حسنة لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا In the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, there is for you a beautiful example, a clear example for the one who desires Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, desires Allah azawajal, and the life hereafter, and remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often. Imam Ibn Kathir, the great Mufassir, he said, فِي هَذِي الْآيَةِ الْكَرِيمَةِ أَصْلٌ كَبِيرٌ فِي تَأَسِّي بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فِي أَقْوَالِهِ وَأَفْعَالِهِ وَأَحْوَالِهِ The Imam, on this verse that I just quoted, he said that this is a, a great proof showing that it's very important to establish the Prophet Sallallahu as your guide in terms of the actions that the Prophet Sallallahu did, in terms of the statements that the Prophet Sallallahu came with, in terms of the context and situations that the Prophet Sallallahu went through. So if somebody wants to purify their soul, they need to be close to the Prophet Sallallahu in terms of his teaching, etc. Hassan al-Basri, rahimullah ta'ala, he said, قَالَ الْقَوْمْ فِي أَهْدِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, إِنَّ نُحِبُّ رَبَّنَا a people, they said in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu that certainly we love Allah Azza wa Jal. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى هَذِي الْآيَةِ So Allah Azza wa Jal revealed a verse based off of their saying that we love Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّنَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ دُنُوبَكُمْ Say, if it is truly that you love your Lord Allah Azza wa Jal, then follow me, meaning Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then Allah will love you in return and forgive your sins. So this is known as the ayat, Ayatul Imtihan, the ayah of the test. Many people, they claim to have purification of the soul, or they claim that they love Allah Azza wa Jal. But if you look into their lives and you scratch away at their behavior, how do you see them emulating? Do they emulate the Prophet Sallallahu or they're far from the Prophet Sallallahu So the closer one is to the Prophet Sallallahu in his beliefs, his actions, his statements, his behavior, his morals, his overall character and guidance, the better off one will be in the state of having their souls purified. So the Shaykh he says, فَاتِّبَعُ رَسُولُ صَلَى اللَّهِ سَلَّمُ وَتَأَسِّ بِهِ دَلِيلٌ عَلَى صِدْقِ الْمَحَبَّةِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى He said that for the one who finds himself following the Prophet وسلم, then this is an evidence for the truthful nature of the one loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لِأَنَّ الْإِتِّبَاءَ وَإِقْتِدَابِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمُ وَسَيْلْ عَلَى مِلْحَاجِهِ الْقَوِيمِ هُوَ أَيْنَ تَسْكِيَ because verily following the Prophet Sallallahu and taking him as a guide and following the straight and upright methodology that the Prophet Sallallahu came with is the reality of purification. So we've been talking about methods and means of purification of the soul and the Shaykh, may Allah preserve me, is saying that the, by you following the Prophet Sallallahu closely, footstep by footstep, that is the reality of purification of the soul. وَلَا يُمْكِنَ الْوَصُولِ إِلَيْهَا بِغَيْرِ مَا جَاءَ بِهِ رَسُولُ صَلَّى اللَّهِ And he said, it's, you are unable to reach purification of the soul 
by traversing a path other than the path that the Prophet ﷺ brought for you. So purification of the soul cannot be gotten by any other way except by following the Prophet ﷺ. And it's an important principle to realize that if the Prophet ﷺ didn't teach you to do something, then it means that Allah doesn't want you to do it. Don't feel that you can come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by virtue of deeds or beliefs that you just make up or that you feel are good on a particular day or in a particular situation. No, it has to be based on the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. To the extent that we have the principle in Islam taught to us by our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, Ummul Mu'mineen, as narrated in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, that she said that the Prophet ﷺ said, Man ahdatha fi amlina hada, ma laysa minhum fahuwa rad. Whoever introduces that into our religion, in terms of belief and actions, that which is not from it, will have it rejected. Imagine that. Somebody spends so much effort and so much time in doing what they think is an act of worship, what they think is pleasing to Allah, what they think is purifying their souls. But because it's on a methodology other than that which the Prophet ﷺ taught or brought, it's rejected. And I, the, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha has another narration in Sahih Muslim which she said that the Prophet ﷺ said, Man amila amilan laysa alayhi amruna fahuwa rad. Whoever does an action not upon our way, then it will be rejected. Can you see the difference between the two ahadith based on this topic? There's a slight difference. What can we benefit from the two versions of this hadith? Somebody tell me. Do you want me to repeat them? The first narration, Man ahdatha fi amrina hada ma laysa minhu fahurad. Whoever introduces into this affair of ours that which is not from it will have it rejected. The second narration in Sahih Muslim, Man amila amilan laysa alayhi amruna fahurad. Whoever does an action which is not from the actions of our religion will have it rejected. So, what can we benefit from two versions of this hadith? We have to stay away from innovations for sure. Exactly, that is the first principle. So we don't introduce anything new. Both of these ahadith are talking about that, but they're looking from different angles. The first one says, whoever introduces something new into our religion. So a person may say, I'm not introducing anything new. I found my forefathers doing this. I found my people of my uh, culture and society doing this. I found my scholars telling me to do this, right? So the second one, the second narration covers that because it said, whoever acts in a way which is not according to the acts of our religion, will have it rejected. So whether you introduce the matter or you act upon the matter, both of them are rejected. You don't have the excuse. Once you come to know that it's not from the way of the Prophet ﷺ, you cannot say it was me who, I didn't start this trend. I didn't start this way of behavior. I'm just following it. That's not correct. So the important thing is that we have to be very diligent in ensuring that whenever we want to purify ourselves, whenever we want to worship Allah Azawajal, whenever we want to please Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and come close to Him, it has to be in accordance with the way of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as understood by the companions and the early Muslims. Why do I say this? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Khairu qalni thumma ladina yalunahum thumma ladina yalunahum." The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "The best of generation is my generation," meaning the companions, then those who come after them and those who come after them. So these three generations are known as the golden age, that they are the ones who we look back to, to try to understand what was the intent of the Prophet ﷺ. How did they understand it? How did they implement it? Imam Malik radiallahu anhu, the Imam of Medina, Darul Hijra, a man came to him once and he said, oh Imam, I want to put on my ihram for Hajj from a little bit away from the miqat that the Prophet ﷺ said. Imam Malik said to him, don't do so. Don't do that. The man said, why? It's only a few miles. It's not much distance. Imam Malik, he said, Imam Malik said to him these amazing, amazing and important words. He said, which tribulation for the soul and the heart and the belief is greater than that one thinks that he has reached a virtue that the Prophet ﷺ abstained from. You see, the man, all he was saying was, I won't put my ihram on in the place where the Prophet ﷺ told me to do it. I will just go a few miles further. It's not very big an issue, but look what Imam Malik said to him. He said, it's going to cause you a tribulation in your belief and your soul. 
that you think that you have come across a virtue that the Prophet ﷺ refrained from. And then he recited the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةً أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ So be warned those who oppose the way of the Messenger sallallahu that a tribulation will befall them, meaning in their belief, or a painful torment, a painful punishment will befall them. So knowingly turning away or knowingly opposing the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is something which is very dangerous and it's not ever, ever going to benefit the soul in terms of purification. Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that purifying the soul is more difficult than curing the body from its ailments. So he said the doctors of the world, they study for decades to reach the level of knowledge that they have where they can guide people in how to cure their bodies. And he said, what do you think about the situation of a person that he goes to the doctor and the doctor gives him a prescription, knowing that the doctor has so much knowledge in this field, yet he turns away from the prescription and goes with what his mind says or what Google says to him. He would think that this is a very strange person. Then how much more is strange the situation of the person who has the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ in how to purify his soul, yet he turns away from that guidance and goes to something other than the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, one of the great scholars of the past, he said, Inna Rasulullah ﷺ huwa mizanul akbar. He said, verily the Prophet ﷺ is the great scale. He doesn't mean scale in terms of weighing up deeds. He means scale in terms of seeing where deeds fit, right? In that sense of a scale. فَعَلَيْهِ تُعْرَضُ الْأَشَاءُ So upon the Prophet ﷺ, things are presented. عَلَىٰ خُلُقِهِ وَسِيرَتِهِ وَهَدِهِ Upon the character of the Prophet ﷺ, upon his seerah, upon his life, and upon his guidance. فَمَا وَافَقَهَا فَهُوَ الْحَقِّ وَمَا خَالَفَهَا فَهُوَ الْبَاطِلِ So anything which agrees with that which the Prophet ﷺ believed, did, and his situations and what he taught in terms of guidance, then that is the truth. And anything which is not found to be from the Prophet ﷺ, then that is not truth, that is falsehood. So it's imperative as a starting point, in fact, in anybody who wants to seek purification of the soul. After the earlier things that we mentioned about understanding Tawheed, etc., is to know how to follow the Prophet ﷺ and to know the importance of that. And generally following the Prophet ﷺ is not something which is extremely difficult. It's that you just try your best to ensure that whatever you are believing, whatever you are doing, whatever characteristics that you have, whatever outlooks you have in life, you find that the Prophet ﷺ spoke to you about this. You imagine that these hadith that we find in the books, they're not just words. They're rather the Prophet ﷺ is in front of you, teaching you and guiding you. So if you're one who tries, if you are one who tries to do that to the best of his ability, then you are following the Prophet ﷺ, even if you make mistakes along the way, because everybody from the son of Adam will make mistakes along the way. The fifth principle that Sheikh Abdul Razak al-Badr mentions, he said, as tazkiyatu, tazkiyatu, takhliyatun wa tahliyatun. He says that purification of the soul is takhliya. This word takhliya means removal, emptying out, and to remove. And then tahliya. Tahliya means to adorn and to beautify. So what he's going to teach us is that for us first, for us to purify our souls, first we need to do tahliya, which is removing. And then we will do that which is tahliya, which is adorning and beautifying. So he says, for example, Allah says in the Quran, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَ تُطَحِّرْ بِهِمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا Take from them, O Rasulullah sallallahu sadaqa, charity, whether it's obligatory or not obligatory charity. And this will purify them. So the, the shaykh, his istidlal, istidlal means the way he's bringing the evidence for his uh, title heading that I just mentioned, right? Which you have to have takhliya, removing first, and then you have tahliya, which is uh, adorning and beautification. He says, if you look at the verse, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً Take from them, from their wealth, O Rasulullah, charity. تُطَحِّرْ تُطَحِّرْهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا This will purify them. So when the Prophet ﷺ takes their wealth from them and they give their wealth as an act of charity, right? This will help remove their sins, the Shaykh is saying. 
So the removal of the sins comes by doing the good deeds. And once the sins are removed, then the tahliya comes to zakki him, purifying them as mentioned in the Quran. So first is to remove the sins and then it's to purify the soul. Because one cannot truly purify his soul if he's still committing many sins. It cannot be the case that your soul will be purified if you are still doing the sins. So what has to come first is the removal of the sins and then comes the purification of the soul. So the Shaykh, he says it's imperative to remove the sins which block the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do sins block the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Exactly, sins cover the heart. Imagine yourself, your heart being like a satellite dish. Right? The satellite dish receives the signals from the satellite in space. But if the satellite, satellite dish is rusty and it's crumbling away because it hasn't been looked, taken care of, how much is it going to receive from the signals? The signals are going to, not going to be very clear. Likewise, the heart, when the heart becomes be corrupt with sins, it may not even receive the guidance. Or if it has the guidance, it won't be able to benefit from the guidance. It won't be able to interact with the guidance and understand the guidance because the heart has been corrupt with sin. That's what the Prophet ﷺ, he said in the hadith in Tirmidhi, إِذَا أَخْتَ الْعَبْدُ خَطِيئَ نُكِتَتْ فِي قَلْبِهِ نُكْتَةٌ سَوْدَاء If a slave commits a sin, then upon his heart, a black dot appears. فَإِذَا هُوَ إِسْتَغْفَرَ وَتَابَ سُقِلَ قَلْبَهُ But then if he makes forgiveness to Allah, he seeks tawbah from Allah, his heart becomes clean again. وَإِنْ عَادَ فِيهَا وَإِنْ عَادَ زِيدَ فِيهَا حَتَّى تَعْلُوَ عَلَى قَلْبِهِ But if he returns again to the sin, then it increases in darkness, and it can be such to the extent that it covers the whole of his heart. And that is the word ran, which Allah mentioned in the Quran. Rather, that is a covering which comes upon the hearts of those who reject the truth of Allah due to the evil that they did. So the hadith is telling us clearly that I've just mentioned that when one starts to commit these sins continually, they start to cover the heart. And Allah mentioned in the portion of the verse that I recited that it can cover the heart completely to the extent that the person doesn't receive guidance anymore. So this is something which is serious to the one who is trying to purify himself. Imam or Shaykh Ibn Sa'di, Sa'di rahimullah ta'ala, he said in his tafsir, Allah says, بَلِ اللَّهُ يُزَكِّي مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifies whomsoever he wishes. He says, Iman wal amal salih This is through having correct faith and through doing good deeds. By leaving, leaving alone um, dirty and lowly characteristics and lowly behavior. al-jamila. And tahalli, the word that we mentioned before in the chapter, in the, in the heading of the principle. tahalli bisifat al-jamila. And adorning oneself and embodying upon oneself, beautifying oneself with those characteristics and those behaviors which are beautiful in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the point that he, the Shaykh is trying to tell us, he's saying that first of all, the person has to look to himself. Is he leaving alone the sins? If he's not leaving alone the sins, then how is he going to purify himself? Because the hadith is clearly telling us that with the sins, the heart becomes covered with darkness and it cannot benefit from the guidance of Allah Azza wa Jal until it makes tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on a side point from this, we should remember that really and truly we are not people who can give guidance and fatwa. What do I mean by that? If there's situations in the ummah that require somebody to give a fatwa, it's not for me and you. Because number one, we don't have the knowledge. Number two, we don't have enough practice of the religion. We're not steadfast enough. So like I gave you the example of the satellite dish, our satellite dish is rusty. We're not looking with basira. We don't have that spiritual guidance from Allah as the scholars have it. So leave this guidance to the scholars because they are those who have the knowledge. And they are those who are implementing the knowledge by the permission of Allah, inshallah, to the highest of levels. So they can see the intricacies. They can understand the nuances that need to be understood. Me and you, we will give the wrong guidance. So let us withhold from answering the fatawa that need to be answered. Because you find today, everybody wants to answer. Everybody thinks he has the right to speak about the religion of Allah at the level of giving fatwa. At this level of reminding each other, it's fine. Educating each other at this level, it's fine. But trying to be a mufti and giving fatwa, no. 
That's for those who are guided from Allah and who can truly see into the religion with depth. The Shaykh, he says, Al Qaidatu Asadisatu. The what principle are we on now? The sixth principle. And this is pertaining to the one we've just taken, but it's a further step. He said, Iglaq al Manafid Alati Tukhriju Bihil Insan and Tazkiati Watubeduhu and Il Fadilati Watu Kiuhu Fil Radilati. He said, You've got to lock the doors and you've got to lock the windows which would allow or which would take the person away from purification of his soul. It would take him away from doing that which is virtuous and it would cause him to do that which is debased. So before the Sheikh, he was talking about we have to leave alone sins. Now he's going to talk to us about that we are in dire need when we want to purify our souls, that we have to ensure that we lock the doors that we lock the windows, that we close the gaps from wherein the misguidance comes. Because it's one thing for you to be making tawbah from the sin, which is virtuous and good. But what happens if you leave the door open? You're just going to continue falling into that mistake again and again, right? So this is what the Sheikh is talking about now. Lock the doors, lock the windows. And Nawas ibn Sam'an al-Ansari, radiyallahu anhu, he said that the Prophet sallallahu said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set forth an example. Allah has set an example of a straight path that is surrounded by a wall on either side. So there's a straight path, on either side there is a wall. And on the wall, along the walls, there are doors, open doors which have curtains in front of them. And there's a caller at the front of the path calling the person and telling the person, oh people, stay on the path and do not deviate from this path. And there's a caller from above the path saying, oh people, woe to you. Beware, do not open any of these doors, for if you open them, you will pass through them. The Prophet ﷺ explained that the straight path is Islam, and that the, the, the sides, uh, the walls on either side of the path are the uh, restrictions or the sharia of Allah, جل, the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the doors are the restrictions, the prohibitions of Allah, جل, that if you were to enter into them, you may be lost. And the caller at the front of the path is the Qur'an telling you to stay on this path and giving you guidance. And the caller from above is that virtuous sound, that virtuous guidance that you have within your soul that is trying to guide you to that which is correct and upright. Hafidh ibn Rajib al-Hanbali mentioning and clarifying further the meanings of this hadith, Hafidh ibn, Hab, ibn Rajib al-Hanbali, he said that the person if he enters into one of these doors, he lifts the veil and he enters into one of these prohibitions, what he's going to find in that door is he's going to find either sin or doubt. And these two are something which spoils the religion of a person. That a person can fall into shubahat, which is doubt, or he falls into shahawat, which is sins. And he said, depending upon how far the person goes into that door, he will be imprisoned within that door of that sin. And this is the reality. Sometimes we open our door of sin just to look in. What's it all about? And we find that we've taken a step or two steps and we can't stop taking those steps. The slope becomes very slippery. And before we know it, we're at the bottom when we're looking up. How did I get here? How did I ruin my life through this sin? I didn't intend this. But because you took those steps, because you removed the barrier which Allah Jal had put there, that's how we ended up right in the depths of that sin and it overtook our heart. May Allah protect us and clean us. Amin. So the Imam, he's saying that it's imperative for us to close these doors and to protect ourselves from the guidance that is contained within. Allah says in the Quran, the Shaykh, he quotes, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّونَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُونَ فَرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَسْنَعُونَ Say to the believers to lower their gazes from that which is not permissible and to protect their private parts from that which is not permissible for, ver for verily that is more upright in terms of purification and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is well aware of that which you do Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala he said that the sins in general are born or emanate from looks that go beyond the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set or speech that goes beyond the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set because verily, these two limbs, the, the eyes and the tongue, they never tire. They never tire from looking and never tire from speaking. So they're the hardest to control and they're the most important to control. 
Imam Sa'di, he says, فَإِنَّمَا الْحَفِذَا فَرْجَهُ وَبَصَرَهُ طَحَرَ مِنَ الْخَبَثْ أَلَّذِي يَتَدَنَّسْ بِهِ أَحْلَ الْفَوَاحِشِ Imam Sa'di said, the one who preserves his eyes and his private parts from that which is evil, then he preserves his soul from falling into that which will debase it and doing that which the people of lust and desires fall into. وَزَكَّتْ أَعْمَالُهُ And his deeds will become purified بِسَبَبِ تَرْكُ الْمُحَرُّمُ Because he left alone that which Allah prohibited. And he will save himself from the propensity of the soul to move towards that which is lowly. And مَنْ تَرَكَ شَيْئًا لِلَّهِ عَوَّدَهُ خَيْرًا مِنْ The Shaykh, he says that whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace it with that which is better. You know, sometimes... It's so foolish that we sin because what are we looking for when we sin or what, are, what do we think we're looking for when we sin? Because really when we sin, we're not using our faculties of intellect. But what do we think we're looking for? Happiness, right? Who created happiness? Allah Zawajal. Who distributes happiness? Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. So how on earth can we find happiness while being an enemy to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala? while going against the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, it makes no sense. We can only find happiness through pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what the Shaykh, the Imam, he quoted here, Shaykh Siddi, that whoever leaves something alone for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it with that which is better. If you're looking for enjoyment and you left the sin, where the enjoyment you thought it was, but you left it out of fear of Allah subhanahu Allah will give you true enjoyment through other means through the means which are correct for you to gather enjoyment from. So the Shaykh, he says that it's imperative for us to close these doors and to close these windows because we're living in a time where sins and tribulations are making the sound like the patter of the rain, meaning that there's so much of them. Wherever you look, there's misguidance. Wherever you look, there's temptation. Wherever you look, there's confusion being presented about what the truth of religion is. So he says we must be like those who are intelligent, and they guard their souls, the purification of their souls, like they would guard their life savings. You know how we are with money, right? Imagine yourself in a place where you know that there's thieves around. And these thieves are breaking into houses. What is precious to you? Are you going to put it out there for everyone to see? Are you going to expose it to the thieves? No, you're going to have it under lock and key. Likewise, the soul has to be under lock and key, away from those and those ideas that try to attack it and try to make it go upon misguidance. So imagine the situation of many of us, many of us, who we allow ourselves and our children to be brought up on the TV shows and movies. It's become so widespread now, hardly anybody escapes this, watching movies and TV. What's in a movie? Okay, maybe it's not a major sin. Maybe you'll find those movies which we can enjoy without major sins, but there's minor sins there, right? And we know that the continuation of the minor sins ends up being like the major sin. So then when the child grows up and he's disobeying you and he's disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can you blame the child? The child for 20 years was being exposed to that which Allah azawajal is displeased with. So this is why the shaykh is telling us that we have to lock the windows and we have to lock the doors in order for us to be able to purify our souls. And it's not something which is easy, but the one who is serious can manage it with the guidance and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The seventh principle that the shaykh he mentions for purifying the soul he says, تَذَكِّرُ الْمَوْتِ وَلِقَاءَ اللَّهِ أَزَّ وَجَلْ To remind yourself that you are going to die and that you are soon going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَالْتَنْظُرْ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ لِغَدْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Oh you who believe, have taqwa of Allah azza wa jal and look to what you have put forward and your meeting with Allah azza wa jal. Meaning think about what's coming. Think about the hereafter. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Ibn Majah, min Increase in the remembrance of that which will destroy the pleasures. What did he mean? Death. Increase in that which destroys the pleasures, pleasures, which is death. Many cultures, most cultures in fact, when they think about death, they think it about, they think about it being something which is morbid and depressing. But not in Islam. In Islam, we understand that death is a reality which we cannot escape. It's something which is coming to us very quickly, so we have to think about it. That's why the Prophet ﷺ guided us towards doing that. 
أينما تكونوا يدركهم الموت ولو كنت في بروج مشيدة الله سبحانه وتعالى says wherever you are going to be death will come and catch you even if you are hiding away in lofty strong fortified towers it will catch you wherever you are when we think about death like we said it doesn't depress you it increases your benefit in life it increases the enjoyment you have in life how can I say that? how can death, thinking about death increase your enjoyment in life? because now you realize that your time is very limited your time is short you don't have time to waste every moment should matter every moment you spend for yourself should be beneficial the moments you spend with your family should be beneficial the moments you spend for your Lord in terms of your deen should be beneficial so you become a person who doesn't want to waste time because you know that your time is limited but even when you're having fun you ensure that you are having fun because this time is going to pass you by so death brings us many benefits it keeps our life in perspective when we think about death of course it purifies the soul we're going to speak about how it purifies the soul but these are extra benefits it keeps your life in perspective you realize that your states in life are always changing Allah says these are days that we just give to people one state to another state your state is always going to change so if you're going through some difficulty in life it's not always going to be difficult that will pass you by. If you're going through happiness in life, it's not always going to be happy. That will pass you by. So you're never a person when you receive difficulty, you're depressed. No, because you know it will pass you by. You're never a person when you receive good, you become intoxicated by it. No, because you know it's going to pass you by. So you have that balance. Why? Because you think about death and you understand the reality of death. You understand that you have to make tawbah to Allah Azawajal all of the time. Because at any moment, death can come to you. You can't be like those who said, I'm going to sin for the first 50 years, and in my last 5 to 10 years, that's when I will correct myself and make tawbah. Allah says, وَلَيْسَتِ التَّوْبَةُ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ سَيِّئَاتِ حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدُهُ الْمَوْتِ قَالَ إِنِّي تُبْتُ الْآنِ حَتَّى إِذَا أَحَدَرَ أَحَدُهُ الْمَوْتِ قَالَ إِنِّي تُبْتُ الْآنِ And tawbah, Allah is saying, is not going to be accepted from those who do evil deeds as much as they want until death comes to them. And in the moments of death, they say, now we have, uh, now we make tawbah to Allah Azza wa Jal. Why is it too late then? When the soul actually leaves the throat, when it gets to that point of leaving the throat, then it's too late for you make to make tawbah. Because then you're seeing the reality, you're seeing the unseen, you're seeing the angels coming to you. And now for sure anybody and everybody will realize the reality of the situation and they will make tawbah. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, in that situation it's too late. But the one who remembers death, will think often of these matters and he will purify his, his soul regularly. So death is not something that we can plan for. It's not something that is going to be, we're going to be given a notice about. It's unexpected. How many people, they came home, they told their families, I'm just getting changed, prepare the food for me. They didn't manage to make it down. How many people stepped out of the house? They just said, I'm going to get such and such from the shop. I'll be back, wait for me. They didn't manage to come back. Death will not wait for anybody, it will come unexpectedly. Imam Ahmed in a zuhud, he mentions that Sa'id ibn Jubair, rahimullah ta'ala, he said, لَوْ فَارَقَ ذِكْرُ الْمَوْتِ قَلْبِي خَشِيتُ أَنْ يُفْسَدَ, أن يفسد عَلَيَّ قَلْبِي He said, if the remembrance of death is not there in my heart for a moment, I feel that it will destroy my heart. Meaning that if the remembrance of death, I'm not thinking about death often, and I come to a state of being negligent, then I feel that my heart will be destroyed, my soul will be destroyed. Because why? Because then the person becomes as though he feels he could do whatever he wants to do. He forgets the reality of the fact that he's going to soon leave this world and soon he's going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and soon he will have to account himself for what he has done. But the person who remembers that regularly, may Allah make us from them, then it is very difficult for him to sin. It's difficult for him to fall into that disobedience because he understands that soon he can be taken. One of the Salaf, Abu Hazim, he was asked, Ya Abu Hazim, Limada nakrah al maut, Lima nakrah al maut. Oh Abu Hazim, why is it that we hate death? He said, Liannakum amartum dunyakum wa kharabtum akhiratakum. He said, It's because you have built up your worldly life, perfected it, to the expense of destroying your hereafter. I mean, you neglected the hereafter. You spent all your time in the worldly life. Fatukrahuna kharuj min al umran il al kharab. So you dislike and you hate to leave that which you know you have built up to that which you know you have neglected and left to be destroyed. And that's the reality of the one who doesn't think about death. How is the soul going to be purified? 
if all he's thinking about is this world and the enjoyments of this world. But don't get me wrong. Like Allah says, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَسِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Don't forget your portion of the world. We're not supposed to go around hunchbacked and depressed. No, Allah wants us to be happy in life. He wants you to enjoy life. He wants you to get married. He wants you to have money. He wants you to dress well. He wants you to smell nice. He wants you to smile. But there's a time for everything. And you should understand the reality of what you have. What we have here is not the be all and end all. It's just a journey. Use what you have to get you to the hereafter. But the only way you will do that is if you remember the reality of death. Because without remembering the reality of death, we will forget and we will become overindulged. So we are allowed to enjoy, but we must remind ourselves. Before we close, we'll take the statement of Ali radiallahu anhu, who said, dunya mudbiratan, al-akhira muqbilatan, wa li kulli wahidatin minhuma banun. فَكُونُوا مِنْ أَبْنَاءِ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنْ أَبْنَاءِ الدُّنْيَا فَالْيَوْمْ عَمَلْ وَلَا حِسَابٌ وَالْغَدْ حِسَابٌ وَلَا عَمَلٌ Ali رضي الله عنه أمير المؤمنين He said verily the world has left and it's gone behind you and verily the hereafter has moved and it's coming closer to you and each one of them have sons so do not be from the sons of this world but rather be from the sons of the hereafter for today, there is action, but there is no accountability. But tomorrow, there will be accountability and no action. Meaning that you have to work hard now. Now you're not being taken into account. Now you have the opportunity to work, to purify your soul. So be from that who is the son of the hereafter, thinking and missing the hereafter. But don't be from the one who thinks that he's only for this world. Because in the hereafter, when you get there, there's no more chance for working. There's only accountability. May Allah Azawajal bring us goodness and purify our souls. Ameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Anything which was correct was as a gift from Allah Azawajal. Mistakes, shortcomings were from myself and shaitan. If you have any questions on the topic, then feel free. Wa jazakumullahu khayrah.